Hi, my name is Pip Kane. On behalf of Cambridge Partners, I want to thank you for taking the time to complete our recent client survey. Your feedback and insights has provided us with rich data and insights on how we can shape our decisions to continue to best serve you. Key feedback is that you value our market insights and economic updates with conversations with your advisor, reading our articles and watching our videos. So on that note, I have much pleasure in introducing Scott Rainey, a senior advisor and member of our investment committee. Scott is going to have a look at the news and what happened with investments in 2021 and discuss what is happening with inflation and interest rates. Welcome Scott. Welcome to my first annual update without any of you actually being here. I must admit to feeling a bit strange, but we've all had to get used to things a little bit different this year. I'm going to begin with some interesting news stories from the last 12 months. Before I move on to reviewing investment returns, I'll talk about inflation and what that might mean for interest rates. I'll follow that up with a wrap up for the year. Another interesting 12 months. One year, I would quite like it if there were no interesting stories, no crises, no financial challenges, no sporting disappointments. I think I will be forlorn in that hope. Joe Biden was inaugurated as US President after a decisive election result at the beginning of the year. By the way, Donald Trump was the second most voted for political candidate in US political history. Let that sink in for a moment. Coronavirus again. The orange blob is the Delta variant. That uh, little symbol in the left-hand corner of that picture is something that should be familiar to those of you who studied physics or chemistry. That's the rate of change. Delta was announced in May 2021, and it is more virulent and transmissible than the Alpha strain, which was the first strain. The Greek letter Omicron appears to be a rather boring O. Omicron was first discovered in South Africa on the 9th of November and has already found its way around the rest of the world. It's still too early to say what that will mean for the virus and the world yet. Another story this year was the blocking of the Suez Canal by the Japanese container ship Evergreen. That occurred in March this year and in the bottom right hand corner of that picture is the Greek letter Pi. Those of you that remember economics will know that that's the symbol economists use for inflation. I'm going to talk more about that later. Oil prices, that's the chart in the bottom right hand corner, increased from around US $45 to over US $80 during the course of the 12 months. This busy slide should be familiar to you. This slide shows the growth of $1 invested in various asset classes, which is what we call investments, from November last year to the end of October. This is something of a slide of two halves, above the green line, and below the green line. The asset classes above the green line were growth asset classes. The ones below the green line were fixed interest. Top of the pops this year was international small companies. One dollar invested in international small companies would have grown to around about a dollar 46 as at the end of the year. A really good result. A very creditable second resplendent in Australian gold is one dollar invested in Australian shares. $1 invested at the start of November last year to the end of October this year would have grown to $1.26. A 50-50 mix of shares and property and cash and fixed interest would have grown to about $1.09 over the course of one year. Those of you that have seen these before will know one year is interesting, but it's not long enough. I always say we need to look at three years of data. This slide shows the growth of these same asset classes over the course of three years. That dip early in March 2020, that's the COVID crash. It's still pretty unpleasant, but given the end point we found ourselves at, doesn't seem anywhere near as painful in reflection as it did at the time. The best asset class over the year again was international small companies, where $1 invested three years ago would have grown to around about $1.58. Most of you that are listening will note that most of that's occurred in the last 12 months. $1 invested in small companies 12 months ago would have grown to $1.46 at the end of 12 months. 
Middle of the good stuff, the high pointy lines, is a 50-50 mix of shares and property and cash and fixed interest. One dollar invested three years ago would have grown to $1.26. That's a pretty good outcome for a time period that includes a COVID crash and the re-emergence of inflation. A return of 7.5% per annum is something you'd take at the beginning of any three-year time period. Inflation has been getting a lot of news coverage in the last few months. The Reserve Bank of New Zealand defines inflation as a general increase in prices. The net effect of inflation is that your dollar is worth less. Inflation has definitely emerged from its cave. Inflation in New Zealand to the end of the September quarter was 4.9%, the highest since June 2011. The US led the developed world with inflation of 6.2% as at the end of October. That is a 30-year record for the US, not really a good one. Australia, at least on this side, had a relatively modest 3.8% as at the end of September for their inflation number. Eurozone matched our inflation at 4.9% for the year. On this slide, I have plotted New Zealand inflation as measured by the Consumer Price Index, or CPI, and the official cash rate, or OCR. The Consumer Price Index is plotted in pink on the left-hand axis, and the official cash rate in purple on the right-hand axis. Those of you that have watched a few of these will note that there's always a bit of pink and purple in my slides. I do, after all, have three daughters. What we see on this chart is an almost binary relationship. When inflation goes up, the official cash rate goes up. When inflation comes down, the official cash rate comes down. The pink spike in December 2010 is when GST was increased from 12.5% to 15%. That's one that the Reserve Bank looked through. This is classical monetary policy in action. Inflation goes up, which leads to interest rates going up to decrease demand, which decreases inflation, at least in theory. And generally, that appears to have worked in a New Zealand context. As New Zealand inflation data only goes to the end of the quarter, that's when my slide ends. Actually, after the 30th of September, the official cash rate was increased to 0.75%. So, if inflation is an emerging problem, how do we resolve it? I know I've already spoiled the surprise here, but by raising interest rates. And that's already begun. I remember, OK from studying, because I did turn two in the first year of the 80s, interest rates in New Zealand being 20%. While interest rates are increasing, they are coming from a low base, and they remain, in an absolute sense, low. However, the trend is increasing. The 10-year government bond rate in New Zealand has increased to 2.38%. That's up 1.54% over the last 12 months. The average since inception is 6.9%. Admittedly, that includes a time period when interest rates began at 17%. Since we started targeting inflation, or at least the Reserve Bank did, in March 1999 with the official cash rate, the average is 4.63%. The US 10-year government bond yield is now 1.42%. That's an increase of 0.46%. Again, not a big move, but from a low base. The long-run average of the US 10-year government bond yield for the last 60 years, 5.9%. The average six-month term deposit rate in New Zealand since March 1999, 4.62%. The official cash rate has increased from 0.25% to 0.75% over the course of the last 12 months. Again low, but the long-term average since inception is 3.97%. What do we expect? More increases. Does that mean we shouldn't have fixed interest in portfolios? No, it doesn't. The reason we diversify is to have investments that zig, go up, when investments zag, go down. In 2008, the year of the global financial crisis, equity markets zagged, and they zagged hard. 
New Zealand shares dropped 32% in the 2008 year. Australian shares were down 35%. Emerging market shares were down 38%. But high quality fixed interest zigged almost as hard. International fixed interest hedged to the New Zealand dollar and New Zealand fixed interest both returned 15% for the 2008 calendar year. That really smoothed off the rough edges of the global financial crisis. Because fixed interest can still do that, albeit to a lesser degree based on where interest rates are at, we think it's still important to have some exposure to fixed interest in portfolios. So, in summary, crises will come and go, but markets will carry on regardless. The lesson from the three-year returns is to stay diversified. Sometimes to get the zig, you need to accept a little bit of zag. Once again, I cannot tell you what will happen next year, at least not till this time next year, but I can tell you how you should respond to it, by staying diversified, sticking to the plan and remaining invested. Thank you for listening and I look forward to presenting to you next year, in person, hopefully. <laughs>